Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we return to our study this week. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction so that we may more properly understand those things that we need at this time? Shall we now seek his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you, Father, for the lessons that you are teaching us, for the opportunities we have to live and work and learn according to your will. We thank you, Father, for many answers to prayer. We ask now, Father, for your direction so that in all things we may learn more as to how to glorify you. Help us now. Be with us, we ask. Show us that which we should do to bring more glory to your name and to your character. May your angels surround us. May your spirit enlighten our minds. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, when we closed yesterday's meeting, we were addressing a couple of issues. Now, one of the things that that we started to address was that there is a correlation with 753, the year in which Rome was established. And when we take a look at this, we, we have been attempting to show a second witness to how Rome establishes the vision. Now, 753 to 508 AD, we would wind up with 1,260 years, which we've had many times established as 42 months. We've had this established as the, the time in which Rome papal ruled the world. But then we also looked that at 753 BC, to 538 AD, we wind up also with 1,290 years. If we put this properly on a line, we would see that 753 to 508, and then the corresponding proof that the pioneers had used from 508 to 1798, both involve Rome. And then when we look at 753 to 538, and its corresponding proof of 538 to 1798, this also involves Rome. In looking at it in this way, would we be able to say that we have a first and a second witness to Rome establishes the vision? Mm -hmm. Now, here again, we have been addressing issues because as I, as I had said last Thursday, I wanted to establish this to where I needed you as my jury. If I'm explaining things clearly, I'd like to know that. If I'm not explaining things clearly, I'd like to know that as well. The reason for these questions is because as we have gone over the articles that we, we began addressing here about 10 days ago, we have found that the author has not been addressing things and making them so that they are clear for people to be able to understand. Yeah, because I've gone through just, you know, cursorily reading those articles, and I have a hard time understanding what his points are. Well, I think so. Yeah, we, we went through this, and I think we had to agree with that as well. Yeah. Now, you know, I mean, everybody's got a different sort of brain and how they think. Right. And of course, everybody has the different levels of skill on how how they, you know, can put together ideas and present them. Some people has sort of have, uh, you know, scattered minds. Um, you know, I've run into that. Maybe I'm that way myself sometimes. But uh, we should be able to understand the points that he's making. And, and I have a hard time understanding, you know, what he's doing with the riddle how he's applying, how he's making applications to some of these things where he talks about typology and yet he doesn't seem to understand it. Um, it doesn't apply it in a way that, that makes sense to me. Now, so you're saying here as, as we're going through and, and trying to understand how Rome establishes the vision, because I, I didn't, I sort of read through the transcript from uh, yesterday's study just really quickly um, so you're doing the study, of course, on uh, Daniel 8 and 9, dealing with the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. 
but then you get into this part um and part of that had to do with um uh you know prescott you know not really accepting the 1260 right well it's it was a two point two point issue number one prescott had made it clear in the 1919 bible conference mm -hmm. that he never again wished to have to make a presentation on the 2300 days right the second thing and this this was brought out in Dwayne dewey's presentation desolations of jerusalem presentation number six that 538 should not have been on the charts because he said 538 was not a valid date that 538 the year in which the papacy began its ascendancy should have been about 200 years later now had he done this had had this point been accepted that would have pushed the ascendancy of the papacy or the excuse me the time of the end until 1998 instead of 1798 yeah yeah well and, and so we know the effect that prescott has had upon adventism so within within you know scholarly adventism you of course have two different sides there are those that still accept the spirit of prophecy and to some degree uh, the 2300 days and the 1260. They may not all accept the 1335 and the 1290, right? So you got some with the kind of a mix of things. So they try to hold on to certain things. But even many who present the 2300 days don't really believe it. I had a pastor like that. He, he did, you know, Daniel and Revelation seminar. He'd present these periods that he didn't actually believe in, right? So yeah, and he'd just say, well, the church isn't ready yet to hear, you know, that these aren't correct. And they work for evangelism. So he would just sort of almost like as a historical, you know, historical sort of information, I guess, uh, trivia almost of, you know, how Adventism came about, but uh, doesn't really believe it's valid. So Prescott didn't really believe in the 1260. And so that's why you're looking at this. So Rome establishing the vision, this 753, which is a traditional date. I mean, it's not a date that we can prove, but as a symbol, it still exists. Right. Right. So that that's an important point that it, it helps become a witness to the 1290 and the 1260. So in this, we, as we had had done studies, in the past on the symbolic use of numbers mm -hmm. here we have numbers that are addressing the symbols that we find on the 1843 and the 1850 charts numbers that we have used as pins and waymarks to establish our faith showing that prophetically these symbols are valid Mm -hmm. Now, part of the rest of what we were addressing was that there have been those in the church that believe that the 2300 evening morning of Daniel 8, 13 and 14 are literal days. And this is this is part of the presentation that Desmond Ford made, both in his teaching and then at the Glacier View convocation. Right, which he had a preterist view. Correct. Now, there are some who still try to apply it more in a futuristic view, future view, <laughs> futurism. Well, from what I understood from, from what Ford had presented, he was believing that this view was strictly and only applicable during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Mm -hmm. Now, it was interesting to me that on Sabbath, Elder Jeff had chosen to give a presentation. He said that was backing up the Friday night studies of those that had been looking into some of the, the items dealing with the times intertestimonial going between 
the last prophet and Christ's first advent to the earth. So it's intriguing when when I have done other study inside the Apocrypha that what we show on the charts right now as the year for the death of Antiochus Epiphanes or 164, Elder Jeff was using 164 as being the year that Judas Maccabeus reestablished the sacrificial system in Jerusalem. Now, that's a little different from what we would find in the book of First and Second Maccabees. I'm still more comfortable with 164 being the year of the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, yet some of the other things that, that he was applying would make us need to look and potentially examine what he's saying. Because his application was <clears throat> that in 164, when this sacrifice was reestablished, should now be applied with, as he sees it, the victory of Trump in the upcoming election. Okay, so so Jeff Jeff Pippinger is going to be using that history which which we don't we don't have as part of the prophecies in Daniel eleven. We don't Correct. mark that at all. Okay, he's going to use that history. So what basis is he using that history? It was his belief <clears throat> in his presentation that when Judas Maccabeus reestablished the sacrifice in Jerusalem, that this is basically predicting Trump's victory as he sees it in this upcoming election. So what on what basis does he do that? Where's the connection? He's using the Apocrypha to make that connection. Yeah, but I mean, I understand that. But I'm just saying, how is he connecting that history to our history? On what prophetic line? I don't know that I could I could fully tell you. I don't know that I could fully explain it. Okay. Yeah, because you would need you would need some line in order to <clears throat> to tie that together. You'd have to have a reform line. You'd have to take that story, put it on a reform line, and show how it parallels our history. Because, you know, when we connect, for instance, the the first seven kings of Persia with the last seven presidents of the United States, I mean, there's a solid reason to do that. Right. OK, I agree. You know, we have we have the times of the end. We have parallel uh, histories dealing with uh, the three decrees and the three angels messages and then the repeat of the three angels messages in our history. Um, you know, we can line these things up in, in a solid way. But just to take that story of uh, Judas Maccabeus and just sort of plop it into our history, I'm not sure how you would do that. Well, I was having a problem with it because this situation out of the Apocrypha is noted twice, once in First Maccabees 1 and a second time in First Maccabees 4. And then when we go into 2 Maccabees 1, much later, they make <clears throat> reference to this again, but it is, it is substantially later than, than what's occurring in the, in the first portion. Yeah. Now, Stephen, you've worked out this a bit more in detail, if you're able to talk here right now. Um, what sort of history is it the, the... Well, dealing with, with Judas Maccabeus, so you've got the defiling of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes, and then you're going to have the temple being restored and cleansed. What's the what's the do you have the dates for those handy? What what? No, I can't remember all found. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean I've worked through them before, but I don't remember them because I've never presented them. When we're Once I present something, it's it's a lot easier to remember. When I just sort of figure it out, it's sometimes hard to remember. Okay, when when we're looking at this, as we would as we would go into first and second Maccabees, there the way that they date things are a little different from what we do. First Maccabees one to five 
establishes the year of the beginning of the rule of the Greeks. Now, here we have a history that shows us that Alexander began to rule roughly about 335 BC. He died in June 323 BC. And then for about a 12 year period, we have the first three of the Diadochi Wars. Yet the time in which the Maccabees established the kingship of the Greeks relates only to the time in which this applied with the promised land, with the glorious land. <clears throat> in Maccabees 1 verse 10, it states that Antioch Epiphanes began to reign in the 137th year of the Greeks, which would likely place that at 175 BC, which we could address from history. In the 142nd year of the Greeks, five years later, they begin the war with Egypt. But in 1 Maccabees 1 verse 20, we have the desecration of the temple because Antiochus Epiphanes becomes angry with the, the people, with the Jews. He imposes taxes in the 144th year of the Greeks or in 168 BC. In the 145th year of the Greeks or 167 BC, recorded in 1 Maccabees 154, we have the altar being profaned. And then in 1 Maccabees 159, it is noted again on the 25th day of Kaslu or Kislev that the altar is profaned. And this would have taken place according to the Julian calendar on the 16th of December of the biblical year 3879. Okay, now, so it's the year 148 on the Greeks? It's the, yes, it's the 145th year of the Greeks. Okay, so the hundred and forty so the hundred and forty fifth year on the Macedonian calendar. So on the fifteenth of Kislev, that's when he, um Antiochus Epiphanes comes into the temple and then And then and ten days Kislev, later does the same thing. Okay, so on the twenty fifth of Kislev. So they're gonna right. go so the fifteenth and the twenty fifth of Kislev, and then three years later on the 25th day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev in the year 148, they're going to cleanse that temple. That's what I have. Somebody has written down here. Okay. My my problem with that. Yeah. Okay. That what we're recording here, we would find in 1 Maccabees 4, 52 to 59, where the altar is rededicated. Okay. So... So I'm just going to put this here. So we got Kislev 15. Right. And that's, is that the Macedonian, the 145? So that's going to be 168 BC? I had it calculated as 167, but here again, I'm willing to be corrected. Okay. So, because I have two different, I have Macedonian and Babylonian years of the Greeks. Okay. Um, so there's two different ways of counting that. So one counts spring to spring and one counts fall to fall, I believe. Okay. Um, so if we were were to have 168, um, then, uh, yeah, so then the 25th of Kislev ends up being December 27th in 168. Would you say that this is going to be 167? which ends up being December 26th. Um, and then you're going to have three years later in 164. So in 164, you're going to have Kislev 25th. So three years later. Is that what? Um, yeah, I'm going to have to figure. I, I've figured this out before. Okay. But it was quite a while ago. So, um, But that's if we're using the Babylonian dates of... Um, 145 and 148, not the Macedonian dates. But I have to figure out what exactly um, is being done in uh, in the Book of Maccabees. So I'd have to do a bit more research on that. But Stephen, you've done this before or not? 
Have you done these calculations before? Uh, my focus was more just on 158. So I never really went so much into... Okay, so you never went into this? Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. I know people try to fit the 2300 days in there, but it doesn't work. That's that's where I've done the calculation before. People have tried to gerrymander the 2300 days into those dates, doing all kinds of creative uh, things. But one thing you can't do is put 2300 days in there. Well, they're going to... 2300 evenings and mornings so they're gonna you know take the span of time and multiply it by two to get 2300 days so it's still not two. gonna work what's that they're gonna divide it by two well what i'm saying is they're gonna count the number of days and multiply it by two to get it to be 2300 okay got it yeah and that's you know that was part of desmond ford's position was mm -hmm. that this time period had to do with the abomination which maketh desolate, and that that is referenced in the Apocrypha. But the problem is, if we look at this correctly, the abomination which maketh desolate, just like the daily, should be periods of 1,260 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, there's all kinds of problems with it. Now, now, as far as the Jews, so when we have Maccabees, I mean, Maccabees right. is, is um, well, when was it written? Is it a contemporary document? How do, how do we understand the history? Because I've never really looked into the history of how we ended up with these, these books of Maccabees. Who wrote them? What, what, what's sort of understood about how those books came about? I mean, I know I know they're written in the intertestamental period, right? They're they're not written later, and they are in Greek, not in Hebrew, right? But who particularly wrote them? What their purposes were? I mean, they do record history, but there are things there that obviously are interpretive as well, that they have some idea of what's what's happening, how they understand that history. And that I've never really looked to in, in any kind of detail. I've just, <clears throat> I've found them to be, you know, strictly historical. So I'm, I'm assuming that this was written as a, as a type of a history, but written, you know, quite a bit after the, the events had occurred. Right. But, but they would record when a person records history, they can record history for a purpose, right? I mean, because they're always going to mention certain things and not mention other things. It's like when you watch the news, it, even if the news is objective, they still have chosen to tell you certain things and not tell you other things. Right. So, so there's always a purpose behind when somebody records something, why they record certain events. So, to me, it would be assumed that they in some way understand these events prophetically, which is why they were recorded. I mean, that's that's an assumption I'm making, uh, whether that's whether it was more objective than that or not. How why they record these events, obviously, you know, they're major events. But I know later on you're going to have uh, the Jews, of course, are going to try to apply these to the prophecy of uh, prophecies of Daniel, right? So they're, it's not Protestants who first make this application. It's going to be the Jews. And when exactly they do that, I would assume that to some degree they would, they would at the time, contemporary, contemporarily, contemporaneously, at the time that it happens, they're going to see Judas Maccabeus as a type of a Messiah, right? Right. But how how much they understand about that, whether they apply the 2300 days, when that's going to be first uh, attempted by anybody to apply the 2300 days to the time that the temple is defiled, that I don't I don't know. I've never really looked into who first makes that application, but I would assume it was Jews who make that application first. And I would, but Protestants pick it up much, much later. So Protestants tend to to not accept that 
but later on with um when she, when you have uh the counter reformation then christians start to adopt this view which was originally promoted by jews right All that's right. my understanding right so you got the preterism you know you got those guys uh, ribera and alcazar um these Jesuits, you know, presenting preterism and futurism, right? So when people put the 2300 days into the future as literal days, that's futurism. When they apply it you know, to the past, that's preterism. When they apply it to that history in Maccabees. But both of them, of course, are incorrect. Right? We're not going to look for 2300 literal days as a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 8. We're not going to deal with some literal temple on earth, and, you know, like the evangelicals do. Well, it's, I, I find it interesting in going, in going through all of this, that this type of application would be now being presented by Elder Jeff. I don't understand the dating of all of these years as you and Stephen and others do, I'm just going according to, to what I'm reading out of the Apocrypha. Yeah. And I'm, again, I'm looking at things in a very cursory manner. Mm-hmm. Now, when I have looked into this and had to consider <clears throat> the differences in what Desmond Ford had been presenting, which Ford, Cottrell, Froome, Reed and Anderson all seem to have some agreement on. I find reasons for why there's such an issue within the church as a whole. So in, in this, I mean, I did, and I, I, <clears throat> I just read what was, what was presented in the chat as in what had occurred stating last night, the seminarian, that is in an evangelical free church there handed to a sister a paper that Antiochus Epiphanes IV outlawed the sanctuary services in 171 BC and that 2300 days later on the date of 25th December 165 the temple was cleansed and its services restored and that so far this this party is not receptive to year day principle but that he would look into this. Now, it, in, it intrigues me when I, when I was going through this because there are those that would say that this was established in 165, but 2 Maccabees 1.10, which supposedly is written later than 1 Maccabees, is also addressing keeping the Feast of Tabernacles in Kislev, which is not possible. Yeah, because that's in Tishri. And if I have read this correctly, this was being stated in the 188th year of the Greeks, which would take it down to roughly 125 BC instead of 165, 164, 165. Mm -hmm. So, in, in having a consideration of this history, is it possible that there are two temple rededications? No. Okay. No, there isn't. So, yeah, I mean, we obviously need to spend a bit of time on, on going through some of the, the arguments that are made regarding this, because obviously it is something that people, people are, we're going to run into. Right. We're going to run into people who talk about this history and try to apply. I mean, I deal with it all the time. Uh, people attacking Adventism who just, you know, want to apply the 2300 days to attack his epiphanies. Um, so I've dealt with it from different points of view that people have had, right, of how they've, you know, how they've tried to work through the dates, which is why, you know, why I don't really remember because it's it's all these different ways of looking at it. So I haven't really sorted that out exactly. But I do know when you go from the Babylonian to the Macedonian uh, on the calendar converter, what you're going to get is when you move into 
the Babylonian calendar is going to be counted spring to spring and the Macedonian fall to fall. So when you get to Tishri 1, the Macedonian will move. But I would assume that the calendar being used there is, is a spring to spring calendar, but I'm not 100% certain in Maccabees. And that would make quite a bit of difference. So I would have to try to work that out again and figure out what I had figured out before on how you're going to date this. But, but the thing is, lots of people bring, people do a, uh, the way that people deal with a lot of this history is they just, they look something up and they, they see a date and they just kind of accept it. They never have examined in detail how that date was arrived at. And, and sometimes they have very conflicting sources Right. So they'll use one source that gives them one date for one, <laughs> another source that gives them another date for another. And and they haven't worked through it at all. You know, so we do this sort of cursory way of looking at things and not dealing with the details. And I think the details are important um, because things can be either seen clearly or they can be, you know, seen uh, like that assumptions people make are completely wrong. Well, one thing I could not do is I could not get 2,300 days, no matter what kind of calendar I used, you know, from 2,300 evenings, mornings to be uh, 1,115, uh, what is it, 1,150 is what you would need. That would be the number of days, the literal days that you would need to fill in 2,300 days. And you can't do it. You know, you're going to be, you know, 100 days off. So I've seen people try to do it, but even then they made mistakes in order to get 2,300 days, like they, like mathematical mistakes, like really simple mistakes. So, but but you're, I guess the real issue here right now at this point is that Jeff is using this history, but just not, there's no contextual reason for him to do that. And it's it, and it would be kind of disturbing in a way that he is doing that, that he's taking this history, which we don't recognize as being part of biblical prophecy and trying to apply it to Trump. Right. That sort of. Yeah, that was that was his point. Mm -hmm. The fellow I was talking with last night said that the ancient Jewish calendar that the calculations were every evening to morning was a full Jewish day. What does that, what do you mean every evening to morning? Yeah, it starts in the evening and it goes to evening. Yeah, well, he was insisting it was evening to morning. And he says, I mean, look at Genesis 1. And I wow. kind of just stared. Uh, <clears throat> All right. <laughs> like I didn't I'm want not, to get into a huge. I'm not really sure what he would mean by that. Well, and, I mean, if he meant like evening being the nighttime and morning being the daytime, that would be correct. But a Jewish day is not just the night. Was it's not just the night because if it was evening to morning, then it would just be nighttime. Yeah. Well, I still believe it's evening. To yeah. Well, he's pretty well, you know, inculcated with this stuff, so. Yeah, well, I know people have come up with all kinds of crazy ideas, but that's because they'll take one verse and ignore all the other verses because the Bible plain, plainly says from even unto even. So, yeah, well, I'm going to post that on his wife's Facebook because he himself doesn't have a Facebook and just say, you, well, you look at this because he yeah. said he's willing to look at other viewpoints, but. He's really pushing Antiochus and all Epiphanies and all this 2300 literal days and stuff like that. And, yeah. And there are a lot of people in this group and they're all, a lot of them have imbibed all this stuff too. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so, but right now with the, with Jeff Pippinger, he's, he's using this history of Judas Maccabeus and trying to apply it to to Trump. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh I, I would find it a little bit disturbing, but uh what's being done with the movement. 
Well, so do I? Well, I got more do there? recall. Sorry, I do recall some of the stuff from Catholic school, but I mean, I was about eight or nine years old. You know, and it's extremely, extremely vague in my mind, and I'm figuring all this stuff is, is definitely coming from the papacy. But these people don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know all of this right now is we we are seeing different symbols being applied and sometimes symbols being misapplied and our responsibility as we study is to be able to rightly divide the word of truth but we also have to be able to explain it yeah well you know well you asked this question about you know is this really clear regarding the 1260 and the 1290 i mean I mean, Stephen had drawn a chart, I believe. I was trying to open, for some reason, I can't open the PowerPoint on this computer here, but um, but I'm pretty sure Stephen did a chart on this. Uh, so, you know, and it, it seems really clear because you have these structures, right? You know, you got, you know, we have the 1335, you know, from the first league with the Gibeonites to uh, the league with the Jew the Jewish Roman League, right? And you have then the 666 years, and then you have 1335 again. And then you have these, you know, the 1260s, the two 1260s making up the 2520 uh, for Northern Israel, the Satanic Covenant counterfeit, you know. And then you have uh, these two 1290s going back to the establishment of Rome, you know, the traditional date. That, that ties you into uh, the 1290, right? So, I mean, the way you have it here, obviously, if we go from 538, or to, so if we go from, you know, so when we have 508, right, that's where the 1290 is going to start. And then we subtract 1290. Right. We're going to get, uh, let me see here. So what, what were we doing? How are we doing this? I'm trying to remember. So I guess, yeah, it's from 538, you go back 1290 to 753, right? That's what you have there. Correct. Um, right. And then we have, I'm, like, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to find Stephen's chart here, but it must be on, let me see if I can find it. it must have been on the Unity yeah, let me see here. Can't seem to find it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where it is. It's, I thought I copied it, but I didn't, I didn't put it into my document for some reason. But we get this witness to the 1290. So from 538 AD back to 753, we get this 1290. Oh, looks like Stephen sent the image here. Okay. Right, so we have these two 1290s, and the way that he drew this out was to have, um, so you got the the two 1260s with the 30 year in between. So that was that was how it was done. So he goes from right. Rome founded in 753 BC. Here, I'm, I'm just going to share this. Okay, uh, stop sharing. Yeah. So you can see we got uh, Rome founded 753 BC. And then you right. take 1260 to 508 so that you get a, a, a chiasm, right? A mirror with right. the 30 years in between. So that becomes a second witness to the 1290. Which is, is beautifully well established. I mean, this helps us to understand that this is indeed Rome that we are addressing. It cannot be Islam. It cannot be France. It cannot be several other things. Here is Rome. Yeah. And we're definitely, you know, if we're going to deal with, um, you know, the whole history of like once Rome establishes the vision, we shouldn't be looking at a Thai kiss epiphanies have, have anything to do with Bible prophecy. Right. Right. Now, of course, you know, doesn't mean that we couldn't use the history that's in Maccabees there and find some parallel to our time. You know, that is, if we could establish it upon a line as some sort of typical line. But my view with the Atticus Epiphanies things is it just doesn't work. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a history that occurred, but I don't see how people are trying to apply it. 
I mean, even with Jeff trying to apply it here to Trump, I mean, I, I obviously I haven't seen his presentation, but, you know, is he trying to apply like the cleansing of the sanctuary as some kind of part of it? Because that's usually what people focus upon. And, you know, I would just have a really hard time to take a Tychus Epiphanies and place it in with Trump. While what we understand about a Tychus Epiphanies on the 1843 chart, right? Right. You know, he, he, unless, he's unless he's saying that Trump bringing in the Sunday law would be like the defiling of the temple. Right. But we're, we're saying that that history is not even relevant when it comes to well, the defiling of the temple. Every wind of doctrine is coming in now. So, <laughs> right. Because we're saying that this has nothing to do with the abomination of desolation, the Tychus Epiphanies. It's just that that is a Jesuit teaching of, of preterism. Or, you know, even if a person is going to use it and, and apply it in futurism, because some people kind of do a dual, they do a preterist futurist uh, way of dealing with that. It's just irrelevant to the defiling of the temple that's being talked about in scripture. And, and to the abomination of desolation that's being talked about in scripture. You can't take that abomination desolation statement of Christ and apply it to Tychus Epiphanes, which is what um, Desmond Ford did and Parminder as well. Right. So Parminder was teaching shortly before the split happened that uh, a Tychus Epiphanes was the abomination of desolation. And it seems like Jeff is going in that same direction, that he's going to have uh, another application, right? So he's going to say in some degree that that was correct, right? That a tie kiss epiphanies fulfilled that. If he's going to try to apply it to Trump, he'd have to have a tie kiss epiphanies as fulfilling that, right? Or how does he get around that? That part of it, I mean, I, I don't have an answer. I listen, I've listened to his presentation. Normally, in a situation like that, I have to listen to him two or three times to be able to fully understand. This is one that it piqued my interest because I had been looking at this history with the, the situation of the Maccabees and when he's bringing up that they they were doing this in their Friday night studies, and then he said, "I'm not trying to add to detract from this. I'm just giving my view." So, okay. Anyway, you can share your screen again or whatever you want to share there. Okay. Well, here here's the other point, and thank you for bringing up that chart that Brother Stephen had had done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm intrigued for a reason in part of what what you had there, because when we were preparing to close yesterday's meetings, I brought this figure back up and we were addressing this symbol in the center mm -hmm. of the 217 years. Now, part of part of what Brother Stephen's chart showed was that the traditional date for the founding of Rome was April 21st of 753 BC. Yeah. Which if you use the calendar converter on a Julian date would show that as being the 23rd day of the first month, right? Um, well, I can check, but I, I trust you. So April, yeah, so the 23rd of Nisan. Okay. Now, there's been a verse that has bothered me as to how we could apply it and how we would look at it. And that's Daniel 10, 4. And as that verse reads, Daniel had eaten no meat and no pleasant bread for three weeks. And this, yeah. this vision again is given to him on the 24th day of the first month. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, 24th day of the first month. Now, I was intrigued when I looked at this using the calendar converter and looking at everything else because this vision is given to Daniel 
217 years after the traditional date of the founding of Rome. Yeah, so if we go plus a day. Why? Right? Well, because it's Nissan 23 and Nissan 24. Okay. Right. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I was just, <clears throat> I was looking at the span of the years at yeah. the 217. Yeah, but I'm saying it's just 217 plus one day. Okay. But we were we were addressing that this 217 year period, this 217 symbol would be that of midnight. Yeah. So what midnight would Daniel be seeing in 536? Now, that's well, that's I mean, not... well, the midnight is is mid midpoint. OK, as, right. Ellen White says midway. You know, between when they were first disappointed to the great disappointment, just to paraphrase, you know, the midnight cry was given in the very words of uh, the parable, you know, behold, the bridegroom cometh go ye to meet him. Right. So we know that Samuel Snow at Boston on July 21st, which, of course, is a symbol of 217. So if you're going to try to apply what what the midpoint is, that's 191 B.C. Correct. Right. For, for this particular figure. Yeah. Which, which so we're dealing with the founding of Rome, and then we're dealing with, in 191 BC, the, the Battle of... Uh, Thermopylae. Yeah, Thermopylae. Yeah. So that's, that's where Rome... Well, why would we... So other than the number 191, what would be the reason we would use that date as that primary midpoint date? What is it symbolizing? The Battle of Thermopylae. I mean, obviously, Rome is beating Greece, but... We you know, have, okay, but we, we'd we also address that because the figure of 191 has the digits of 911. Yes, I know. But besides the digits, right? So lots of times when we deal with a date in history, like, right. for instance, you know, we have August 11th, 1840, which is the date, you know, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And it's not going to fall until the 1920s, right? So so people will say, well, you got the wrong date. But there, there would be a reason why we would choose that date and that event over the other dates that secular history would choose for something because we're looking at it prophetically. So the question is, in 191 BC, what is there prophetically, besides the symbol of 191, about that battle of Thermopylae that would mark it as midnight, that would mark, mark it as being more significant than some other battles, right? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So what, what's particular about that, that victory of Rome over Greece? Like historically, I I had looked at this as being the the time in which the Greek forces were no longer capable of defending their empire. Okay, I mean for this battle to have taken place at Thermopylae, just like the prior battle of Thermopylae, where Greece defeated media persia showed that media persia was not capable of defending its empire and the greeks were well able to defend their territory here the greeks were not able to defend their territory and they were no longer able to stand for their entire empire because they had already been divided okay and then we have the Battle of Thermopylae on April 24th, 191 BC. Okay. So um, we have um, the founding of Rome is April 21st, right. 753 BC, which is the 23rd day of the first month. Right. right. Now, Daniel has this vision on the 24th day of, of the first uh, month. Of the first month, which happens to be the 23rd of April. Right. In, um, and that's in, in 536. And then you have the Battle of Thermopylae 
on April 24th, 191 BC. And I'm just going to look at the biblical date. That's going to be the 29th of Nisan. Um, so they're all they're all similar solar dates, right? 24th, 23rd, 21st, they're all around that time. So it's kind of interesting that they're not all exact the same date. And then the Battle of Thermopylae itself. So, I mean, there's this, this war between the Seleucid Empire and Rome, and it's one of the battles, right? So uh, just trying to see here um, why we would mark that. Sorry about that. Somebody's going to turn off those notifications. Okay. So can you fill me in a bit more what you think about what that battle meant? You're saying that that's just where Greece could no longer win battles against Rome. Like, is Greece, it a turning Greece, point? Okay. Let, let's remember, by 191 BC, the empire of the Greeks had been divided to the four winds. You had, well, long, Yeah, long before that, yeah. You had only those that were Macedonian that were remaining as part of the original Greek empire that was going to go up against Rome. We're not talking about the Ptolemaic. We're not talking about the Seleucid Empire. We're talking only about the Macedonian portion. Well, yeah, so here Antiochus III, he's going to have an alliance with Philip V of Macedon. Okay. Right. And they're seeking, uh, so that's, let me see, so that's going to happen earlier, right? 198, right. Antiochus emerged victorious in the Fifth Syrian War, taking over um, hollow Syria and securing a southeastern border. He then focused his attention on Asia Minor, launching a successful pack campaign against coastal Ptolemaic possessions. So, so there's all this precursor to what's happening in that battle. And then, um, so, so the Aetolian allies they're going to have in that battle. Uh, let me see here. Uh, let me see. So, so Antiochus positioned his Macedonian in the battle, the Macedonian phalanx, behind the rampart while the Argaraspides and the light infantry stood in front of it. The Seleucid left flank was composed of a few hundred archers, right? So it's going to go through some of the detail. So, so I guess here it's just Macedon is involved in it, of course. So, so it's just finally when Rome conquers them, but there's still going to be more battles. Sure. Right. But it's just more the beginning of the end. How would we mark that? Like what what prophetically would we connect? Right. It's easy just to say, well, this was significant. But besides the number 191, besides being the center of that uh, 62 weeks, is there some other way that we can connect it? I mean, I just don't know enough about about it. We know it's in Thermopylae. We know that that be, is a symbol, right? Because of what had happened with the Battle of Thermopylae and the 300 uh, Spartans, right, as a symbol. I mean, this is sort of when Rome actually takes over Greece itself, right? Correct. Right. So maybe that would be part of it, is that they actually conquer Greece as a territory. Because we recognize that there ha there has to be three geographical areas that they conquer. Okay, so conquering Greece, the 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 area of Greece, so that it's now part of the Roman Empire. That's what happens with this this battle. Correct. Okay, so that would make sense then. So if if, if this is the first of the three, then we should see two further geographical areas fall with one of them being the glorious land. But Which, that, of course, does happen. It, it does happen because we have, within 30 years of this battle in 191 BC, 
Yeah. We, we have the the Jews seeking the alliance with Rome. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, and here, too, then, like when we deal with the Seleucid Empire, I mean, the Seleucid Empire, uh, I mean, the main part of that would often we would say, well, that's Syria. Right. That's the territory that the Seleucids. Right. Are, are dealing with. Right. But here, this is actually Greece itself. So that initial part of that kingdom from where Greece origi originates, right? The Greek Empire comes from Greece, and that's conquered in 191. But see, that, that that's also interesting to me because then since this league, as Smith pointed out, was sought in 161, that would mean that the league was being sought 187 years prior to the baptism of Christ. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you have uh, 161 plus uh, 26, yeah, 187. Yeah. But also here you have the 30 years too. Right. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing that I was looking at, and yes, I know I sound like a broken record, always finding these 217s. As we have, as we have been studying, we know that Zechariah and Haggai were prophesying at roughly the same time. Now, it struck me when I'm looking at this in reference to the founding of Rome and then this 270 years plus one day of Daniel's vision in Daniel 10.4. When we bring up Haggai 2, verse 1, that vision is being given on the 21st day of the seventh month. Um, okay, so so in Haggai, yeah, yeah, so the 20, 21st day of the seventh month, now the, which is in the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. The intriguing portion of that is that that is occurring 49 days after his vision, instructing them to restart the work on the temple in Haggai 1.1. Yeah, because that's going to be uh, the first day of the sixth month. Right. So you got... So what other application could we yeah, make? It's the, and it's the 50th day, right? So 49 cardinal days, but it's the 50th day. Okay. I think I did that right. I think you did it right as well. Yeah, so that becomes a symbol between these two dates. Correct. So why are all of these 217s popping up? Why are these also with an interrelation to 187 and 49 or 50? All of these things we're finding throughout Scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, then, and we know the primary... Uh, symbol from 187 has to do with the fact that the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the Jewish year. Right. Right. So that that's the primary thing. It's not, you know, July 18, 2020 is not the primary uh, symbol, right? It's just that these symbols pointed to that date. And so we can see the significance of that date in our, in our movement of, of where it came from and what it was to represent. Because you know we misinterpreted what it was to mean to the movement. I mean, it could have meant that you know if the movement had been faithful, there wasn't all the infighting and jealousies and and uh, you know resentments and things like that. The movement could have fulfilled its role, but the movement didn't. Right? right. Similar to the right movement, October twenty second, eighteen forty four. You know, Christ could have come here this, right? So we know that, you know, this movement becomes a parallel. Now, there are, of course, bigger issues that, you know, that uh, are existing now within Adventism and trying to figure out the role of what it is that we have learned from all of this and how that's going to, what part that's going to play in the bigger picture, you know, we don't know, right? On, on Sabbath, I had a conversation with... Uh, uh, a guy named Ted. So he's, his, his actually his name's Teddy, but uh, 
It's not Theodore. But uh, anyway, he's an interesting conservative Adventist guy. Sees pretty much everything the way that I do when it comes to righteousness by faith and, and uh, you know, the spirit of prophecy and, and so forth. I hadn't looked at the 2520, so he's going to take a look at it. But part of our discussion really was about, um, well, he brought up Conrad Vine. Of course, probably everybody knows all about that whole controversy, which uh, I guess he said some provocative things about something about a parallel conference that they're because, and I'm not sure what he meant by it, but uh, are pe people familiar with that? What's on I'm that? Not. Okay. Something yeah, I've, heard, I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah. So yeah. something he talked about. Yeah. So he sort of had a caveat that sort of if they were to continue with the, the next pandemic, pandemic, do the same thing with uh, the mandates, you know, that there's no conscience, liberty of conscience issue with the, he, he right. was saying that there's a potential for someone. He wasn't saying he was going to do it himself. He <laughs> said there was a potential for someone as in, that would, that could spur someone to then set up like a power church where you have like a just people given to within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but those who are kind of like celebrating in some way from the main body. Yeah, yeah, it was totally misconstrued what he said, right? But he got in trouble for it. And uh, it, so he wasn't necessarily advocating it per se, but he was saying that that something would have to be done in that sort of scenario because the, the, it was about religious freedom. That was the topic of his presentation, right? Yes. Freedom of conscience and that, that that's been transgressed by the conference. So, yeah, I mean, obviously what do you do in that situation? I mean, if ministers who didn't, don't want to get, they didn't know that kind of stuff. But anyway, you know, so there's that those issues that uh, that are existing within Adventism. But but the question to bring it back to sort of what we're you know, we we find all this information. So the question is, what what is the use of what we have learned? I mean, how is it going to be applied? And what, what I would say is that um, we need to leave that in God's hands. All we do is study. God's word. I believe that God is, is there's people all over the world who are studying. They're not necessarily coming to all the same conclusions in the same way that we are. They might be coming to maybe the same conclusions in a different way. You know, God's going to bring this all together at some point. What we can see is where the dangers lie. So the idea, you know, that, you know, we're going to look to some new organization, you know, a parallel conference or some prophet or, you know, somebody who's going to lead the whole movement all together other than Christ, I think is the real problem within Adventism is that everybody wants to be heard and nobody wants to listen. And the way that we've approached this now, how far did you get in the studies um, dealing with Glenn's studies? I think we got through the first three articles. We were about to go into the fourth. Okay. Yeah, because, um, yeah, so you went through the 300 foxes and Samson's right. rhythm. Right. Yeah, so I think tomorrow we should just kind of do a review of what we think he's saying about those things. Right. If we can make sense out of them. And so, so what we are doing is, you know, in going through this, the purpose of it, one is we need to look at what other people are saying. But there are some things that he are, he's saying that do make sense, but it just it's not presented well, and it's not tied to what we already know. That is, there's things we know that he doesn't, right, that yeah, can help us agreed. make more sense of this. So, so I think it would be a good idea to review Samson's riddle, what we understand about it, and the tale of the 300 foxes. Uh, before we go to Samson's descent into Laodicea, which is part four. Okay.
his studies. So I don't know. That's what I think we should do tomorrow. All right. Then we'll prepare for that. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? Well, I hope that, you know, what we've covered you know, over the last couple of days has been a benefit. My concern is yet that, you know, anything that I'm, I'm presenting, I want to make sure that, that I'm able to do it clearly. I don't want to be confusing people. Mm-hmm. Yes, I get fixed. I, I get fixated on a lot of symbols and numbers as symbols because I can see how this is going to be very important for us to be able to explain things to people. Yeah. Well, right now we're not really presenting stuff. We're actually just studying and trying to sort through it. Right. Um, so, you know, I mean, if we, we did a presentation, we'd have it all sorted out and we would say, here's, here's what we believe. Here's why here's, you know, it's all, all laid out with nice charts and, and dates and everything. But at this point, you know, we're just trying to sort through through what's happening, you know, within the church and what's been happening within the movement and what we see in scripture and what we see historically. And how do these things apply to the present time? I just don't think that we can take a Tychus Epiphanes and just say that he is, you know, what what happens there uh, or with Judas Maccabeus or anything that we could put Trump in there. Well, again, I mean, it, it's, it's just looking at, at the headlines and and then just haphazardly applying uh, prophecy to what we see in the headlines, just like the evangelicals do. Right. Yeah. And and so from what I see, and I don't mean this in a mean way, but but Jeff should have gone back to what he said back in September 7th of 2019, but basically that. Because of promoting Parminder, he was unfit to lead the movement, that his judgment was impaired. And especially after July 18, 2020, and Jeff's reaction after that, for him to come back and say, I'm now the prophet and you should need to listen to me, after so being wrong so many times, I don't see a precedent for that in Scripture, that we would just blindly follow Jeff. It's not what we're supposed to be doing at this time. We need to be studying, right? And and studying knowing that we don't know anything, right? That we're trying to understand the truth. We have to go back and examine and see, you know, what, what did our experience mean? And to just sort of say it was all wrong and all error, or the pattern of that is the first day Adventists, right? Not, not the seventh day Adventists. Okay. Okay, well, thanks, Dwight. So you can close with prayer. All right, thank you. Gracious Father in heaven, we know that all wisdom comes from above, all true wisdom, and that there is nothing in and of ourselves that can be used to commend us to you. Forgive us of our sins. Please direct us in our thoughts and our actions and our speech. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together in study and consideration. We ask now, Father, for your guidance through our day. Be with us so that which is done may be glori- may glorify your name and your character. Help us now to do that that you would have us to do until we, turn ag- until we return again tomorrow. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.